Okay, good morning everyone. We are glad we are here and to uh, proceed to our uh, A session in the area of theology. And before we proceed, I ask Pastor Kado to offer an opening prayer. Shall we all stand? Let's pray. Loving Father in heaven, this uh, wonderful morning, we humbly come before the throne of grace. And uh, we count this as a privilege to listen to different presentation and research. And because of that, we are inviting your presence to be in our midst so that as the presenter, we present your topic. This topic will not just be for the sake of presentation, but for us to be benefited. And please guide us, dear Lord, that through the help of the Holy Spirit, we will not just listen, but we will be able to understand and enable to apply principles and concepts that we will be learning. Thank you so much, loving Father, for the assurance that you will be with us. Please be with each of the presenters, as well as the, part, the facilitators. Just be pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, the time we'll give to Pastor Fernando to present uh, his research and your time not more than 15 minutes. Thank okay, you. thank you so much. Okay. <clears throat> Good morning, everyone. Uh, even though we would like to uh, uh, wait for others who possibly may be coming, uh, but uh, since the program uh, there at Finster was uh, because of so many things that we have learned from that program, we are joyful as well. No? And uh, this morning, uh, it's my privilege to share uh, this particular topic, especially because I feel, in a sense, that uh, as uh, ministers and pastors, we should be engaged in this particular area of ministry. And I believe that this area of ministry is dispensable, okay? Especially when it comes to our uh, pastoral work as uh, ordained minister or even non-ordained, uh, the church eagerly uh, wants to see every one of us equipped with this kind of ministry. And so I would like to present this morning the different uh, models of counseling. And uh, of course, the one that is hotly debated and as until now has not been uh, uh, found any consensus is the relationship between theology and psychology in the field of pastoral counseling. And so I do believe that uh, this particular topic will some, somehow provide um, a paradigm where those practitioners, whether in the professional or non-professional field, will be able to, uh, to have some ideas on how to really integrate these two fields and disciplines that we have, okay? Uh, for the introduction of uh, my paper, I highlighted that pastoral counseling has been considered as one of the major areas in pastoral ministry. In other words, whether we like it or not, <laughs> one of our works is to counsel, okay? So we cannot avoid that, especially when our members come to us with problems, concerns, and so as pastors, we need to know how to counsel. And so, uh, however, the relationship between theology and psychology, as it pertains to uh, pastoral counseling, has generated several diverse views and arguments. So there are many uh, debates and uh, you know, views about the relationship between theology and psychology in the area of counseling. And so the purpose of this study is to determine the relationship between theology and psychology in that ministry of pastoral counseling. Is there a relationship or none at all? That's the big question that you would like to uh, address this morning. Okay, now I utilized a qualitative method okay, that aims to evaluate and analyze the strengths and weaknesses of the different models of counseling. And this approach is syncretistic and eclectic, that is bringing together the positive elements and contributions of each counseling models that find an avenue where both theology and psychology complement each other in the counseling process. So even though there are many models that have been proposed, I opt for an eclectic model because I do believe that such model will find a more effective approach when we do our ministry 
of counseling. So actually, there are two views about the relationship between theology and psychology in counseling. The first view is what you call the integrationist view. This view holds that theology and psychology are not in conflict, and we can use both in the area of pastoral counseling. However, not everyone agrees with that because there are those who hold that theology and psychology are two distinct fields, and there is no way of harmonizing them or integrating them. So either a counselor would dwell or, or use theology or psychology, but integration is not possible according to second view. So there are two primary views, the separation view and integration view with regards to the relationship of theology and psychology. So let me now uh, mention two major models that are part of the separation view. Or shall we say, yeah, separation view. It means that, what is separation view again? That there is no relationship or possible way of integrating those two disciplines in the area of counseling. And so the first level, the, the first model is what you call the level of explanation model. So what does it mean? As part of the separation view, this level of explanation, this model, right, adheres to the dualism principle. It means that there is still, there is dichotomization, dichotomizing the two, theology and psychology. And the integration of theology and psychology is only possible in a very limited scale in the counseling process. The spiritual nature of theology limits its approach to human spirituality, his relationship to God, and the problem of sin. It is far different from the realm of psychology where the focus is the function of the human brain, emotional issues, and human relationship with the social environment. So if you're going to, to uh, summarize in a nutshell the view of the level of explanation model, theology belongs to the other discipline or the other field, but psychology is also another one. So there is no way, in case there is, it's very limited, almost insignificant, okay? So another, another view is what you call the biblical counseling model. This view also belongs to the separation view, okay? This model also believes that there is no relationship between psychology and theology in the area of pastoral counseling. But does it say? The biblical counseling model belongs to the separation view, but opposite to the position that the labels of explanation model holds. It has a strong criticism against using psychology in a high level of distrust in psychological methodology. This model is a reaction against using psychological theories and methodology instead of theology. So on this particular uh, model, it, is, it uh, obviously opposes the view of the first model that I have shown because this model strongly advocates the use of plain theology because psychology is suspicious. You know? uh, in, in many research, I have found out that the main premise of this is that psychology is too human-centered while theology is God-centered. And so in the practice of pastoral ministry, theology is what really is uh, appropriate in the area of pastoral counseling. Okay, so now, the, the next two, the last two, belong to the integration model, okay? And this letter C, the, the third one. The clinical pastoral care model belongs to the integration view. This model agrees that both theology and psychology have their contribution in the counseling method and process. The main issue in the evaluation of clinical pastoral care model is the question of priority. Even though we can combine both, but what precedes the other? Or who takes the prominence? Or, or shall we say, what should be the priority uh, between the two? The clinical pastoral care model draws more insights from psychology than theology. If there is a conflict between theology and psychology, clinical pastoral care model allows psychology to hold sway. In other words, even though they use both theology and psychology, but the priority is psychology. So if there is a conflict between the two, psychology should be prioritized, you know? should be the one that is more uh, authoritative. 
Okay, so the, the, third, the fourth one, the Christian counseling model, is a reaction actually against the third model. So the Christian counseling model is another approach belonging to the integration view. It agrees with the concept of the clinical counseling model that, human is, that humans are whole beings. Okay? But unlike the clinical counseling model, the Christian counseling model considers the Bible as the dominant authority in doing pastoral counseling. This model criticizes psychology as theory-driven, even though it gives room for the use of psychology, psychological techniques and approaches. So it does not negate the use of psychology, but the priority is the Bible. Okay. Uh, in other words, psychology takes the secondary role, but the Bible is the uh, primary source of authority. So this is the summary, how I wish that I could explain all of this, but because of the lack of time, this is the summary of both the integration and the separation model. And I also included the, and what, how to summarize these uh, four areas. And there comes my proposal, okay? My own way of looking at those models that had been proposed. Okay, so, so we see here in the, in the upper uh, two quadrants are the integrationist and the lower two quadrants are separationist views, view, I mean. And so we can see how they, uh, they have their own way of looking at the relationship. The Christian counseling is more on theology focus, even though it uses psychology. This part is more on psychology, even though it uses theology in counseling. On this separation, biblical counseling rejects any use of psychology, but in the level of explanation, it rejects any use of the Bible or theology in doing counseling. So we have those. So what now is my, my uh, summary, conclusion, and recommendation in my paper? Theology and psychology have their own contribution in pastoral counseling. Holistic approach, this is the key that I would like to highlight in the paper. Holistic approach gives room for each field to perform their roles and functions in the counseling process. Therefore, this paper proposes an eclectic or syncretistic model as, as a more effective and responsive approach to pastoral counseling. Theology and psychology have the commonality of aims and purposes. Of, of course, some of them are to search for the truth, to help someone who is struggling emotionally, spiritually, and, and, and so forth and so on. So because of the commonality of aims and purposes, so helping individuals to move on during their emotional, mental, spiritual problems, at the same time helping the counselee to find meaning, purpose, direction, and hope in their lives. So we see the commonality of uh, the purpose of both. And so because of that, uh, my paper strongly uh, favors okay, that we should not discard one in favor of the other. But rather, my, uh, my paper proposes that it should be an eclectic approach in view that all of those models have their own strengths. That if we can gather all of those strengths and put them into one model, and that is what you call the eclectic approach, that approach is much, much more beneficial and helpful to the counseling, okay, to our counseling. So all of them can be used with their strength and contribution in the area of pastoral counseling. I don't have time to mention all of those strengths, but all of them are, are in my paper. So all of those strengths should be integrated in the eclectic model of counseling. What is the recommendation? Since this one is uh, not yet very clear in many professionals and non-professional uh, counselors, I recommend that those who are engaged in pastoral counseling ministry, either they are professional or non-professionals, they should be made aware and trained on how to utilize the strengths and contribution of each of the four models in various situations and cases of their counselees. So there is a need to train uh, counselors to look at those positives of those models and integrate them in their counseling uh, ministry. And so if this is done, so the counseling process will be more effective more um, relevant, and it would really help the counselee as he or she struggles in some issues of his or her life, emotionally, spiritually, uh, in terms of attitude and whatsoever. So the, the eclectic model, I think, is the best approach to integrate both theology and psychology. Thank you, Dr. Fendona. 
uh, we have still have uh, three minutes. If there is one question, please. Dr. Walila. But it doesn't mean that when you talk about degree or level of usefulness, that we look down in one and consider the other as more authoritative. So in my point of view, each of these uh, uh, models, four of them, have their own way of contributing and dealing with the problem of the person. Now, however, uh, because situations differ, you know, they differ, there are some points where psychology would contribute a lot without setting aside the Bible. For example, I have some case in my paper that I have, uh, how I wish that I could present that. There are those who are struggling with their behavior, okay? Of course, there is a limitation because if it's beyond counseling, for example, it's a problem of the mind, you know? It's a psychiatric problem you have to refer, you know, to, uh, to uh, uh, professionals like a uh, psycho psychiatrist or whatsoever. So, um, the question, uh, Dr. Balilla, is uh, highly subjective of the patient's uh, condition, okay, the patient's uh, situation. But nonetheless, even though uh, there are adjustments in how we use psychology and theology, uh, we are not making them compete with one another. Maybe okay, that's right. Pardon? Maybe in the case of mental health. Oh, uh, if mental health problem, then we need the, the help of those who are uh, speciali specializing in the cure of, med uh, for example, psychiatrists or, or, or psychologists also is a great help for that. But pastoral counselors do not take their place because what we have is really to help them with their emotional, spiritual problem, but we have a limit. Once we have sensed that the problem of our counsel is beyond our parameter, it is the time for us to refer that to other professionals. So we consider everyone, professional, non-professional, psychologists, psychiatrists, as our teammates. There is no competition, no? and there is no dichotomization of work because all of us can work together to address the problem of our counseling. Yeah, yeah ma'am. Okay. Time is gone, so. <laughs> okay, maybe one. <laughs> okay. Okay. Can I have the Yes, ma'am. Sure. Okay. Thank you, Pastor, for the explanation. Yeah. Uh, I'm Mrs. Yanis Sinaga. I'm the UNAI counselor, and yeah, I'm okay, just recently okay. uh, finished my licensure for pastoral counseling in Indonesia. It's really interesting. Your material is how to combine yeah. the psychology uh, setting with the theology setting. Yeah. In my experience as a counselor, I deal now with the depression students. Yeah. Of course, yeah, we accompany them. We try to help them, but they say that we cannot say that. Oh, 70% psychology yeah. and that 20% uh, uh, are theology. Yeah. No, it's combined. Right. It's merged. Yeah. Yeah? So that's why, uh, for me, the, the most important thing is that the student can, uh, can train to become yeah. depending right. on God yes. in, their, in their problem. Yeah? So that's why uh, it's not easy because sometimes it's episodic. That's why we cannot use only uh, counseling process yes. but also, also therapies. Uh, medical we we refer to the psychiatrist and during the medication also we combine the medication and the counseling psycho psychotherapy that's yeah. right the doctor said also we cannot use only the medicine Correct. but use also psychotherapy and especially counseling process yes. pastoral counseling so this is maybe the new field for the theology yeah. but it's really interesting it's really challenging challenging yeah. Hopefully, we can improve it more and more and we can yes. apply the theology and uh, psychology together to yeah. help our students. Yes, thank you, ma'am. And that is my recommendation in my paper that uh, practitioners of counseling should be trained well on how to integrate the strengths of all of these models in counseling. Thank you very much. And now, 
I present the a certificate of presentation is given to Dr. Andres to Fernando for delivering an oral presenting entitled Model of Counseling, the relationship between theology and psychology in the field of pastoral counseling, signed by the four presidents of the Colorado in uh, Okay, the next presenter is Efriadi. Can you take picture of Okay, <laughs> come. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you. So the next presenter is uh, everybody Sihaan with the title Students' Attitudes and Behavior in Worship in Relation to Academic Achievement in an Indonesian Adventist Institution. Now's your time. Thank you, Prof. Good morning, scholars. This time I will present my paper, and before I start to present, let us pray. Our precious Lord in heaven, thank you for your guidance to us. And now, Lord, please help us to understand this paper by your Holy Spirit, and let this paper only to glorify your name. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Okay, as we can see, this, uh, the title of my paper, Students' Attitude and Behavior in Worship in Relation to Academic Achievement in, in, in an Indonesian Adventist Institution. I wrote this paper uh, with my advisor, Dr. Alvin Hendricks. He is my dean. This study investigates students' attitude and behavior in worship and their relationship to academic achievement uh, and based on the core value of Christian belief that fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, said Solomon, King Solomon. And then this, the study is aimed to find out how their attitude and behavior in worship affect the academic achievement. As Christian, we believe that uh, the foundation of all knowledge and wisdom is is the God, uh, according to uh, Proverbs 1, verse 7. And many uh, scholars, Glass and his friends, comment that several have proved that people with a high level of religiosity generally show positive attitudes such as being responsible, tolerant, and committed to their work and colleagues. Also, Pierce uh, and his friends claim that rel religiosity can be measured by the act of worship, such, such as the pregnancy of someone visiting and doing religious tasks in a church or participating in religious activities. This study, this paper, investigates issues about worship and academic performance of the student in a faith-based Christian higher education institution run by SDA Church in Indonesia. Okay. Uh, talking about methodology, uh, descriptive statistics were used to measure students' attitude and behavior in worship. And multiple regression was used to analyze the influence of attitude and behavior as independent variable on academic achievement as the dependent variable. Also, a pervasive sampling method of 30 students. Uh, this is uh, uh, taught by my professor, was carefully selected by a team. And then, the selected samples consist of 13% students with academic performance were barely passed. Another 
uh, 13 person with excellent academic achievement or f just only for uh, for students and 34 person with fairly good academic performance and 40 person the majority perform well also the regression equation for predicting academic achievement based on attitude and behavior are written as follow GPA is equal B0 plus B1 times attitude plus B2 times behavior plus error. And uh, as the result and discussion, as we can see in this uh, slide, the summary of descriptive statistics, there are four uh, groups of the students. And then as in interpretation, I will, uh, the next slide, this is the attitude, the result. Attitude in worship, uh, this is attitude, and this is the explanation. Students with excellence, academic achievement, with main GPA 3.69, and the standard deviation is equal 0 0.12, show a very high rating on attitude in worship. The good academic achievement students with main GPA is equal 3.23, and the standard deviation is 0 0.84 also show a very high rating on attitude in worship. These two groups believe that worship has a meaningful purpose in their life, an important aspect of life, and gives inner peace and make life happy. While students with mediocre academic achievement with main GPA is equal to 0.84 and the standard deviation is equal to 0.16, still consider worship as an important aspect of their life. But Low performed student with main GPA is equal to 0.33, and the standard deviation is 0.10, gives a low rating on the attitude in worship. They perceive that worship program as what? As a burden, an activity that annoys them and will not enjoy and be happy with it. Also, this is the interpretation, explanation of uh, the behavior in worship according to this uh, uh, descriptive statistic. Okay, the students with excellent academic achievement show an even higher rating on behavior in worship with men is equal 3.50 and the standard deviation is 0 0.58. However, the good academic achievement students show a lower rating on behavior in worship when compared to their rating for attitude. Students with mediocre academic achievement and low performing students give low rating on their behavior in worship. Yes, like this. They attended worship to avoid punishment. Just what? To avoid punishment and not take a part in leading, nor taking responsibility in the worship program. And then, this is the uh, summary of regression. And the explanation, this is one. Attitude and behavior in worship in relation to academic achievement. The regression coefficient are, stati are, are statistically significant with p-values less than 0 0.05, indicating that both attitude and behavior are significant predictors of academic achievement. The, co the coefficient for attitude is 0 0.4657, which means that a, a one unit increase in attitude is associated with a 0 0.4657 unit increase in GPA, holding behavior constant. Similarly, the coefficient for behavior is 0 0.3439, which means that a, that a one unit increase in behavior is associate, associated with a 0 0.3439 unit increase in GPA, holding attitude constant. So the multiple R square value of 0 0.6771 indicates that about 68% or the majority of the variance in GPA can be explained by the model. The adjusted R square value of 0 0.646 indicates that the model fits the data well and not overfitting. So, as the conclusion, the study concluded that students with excellent academic achievement and students with good academic achievement have a very good attitude in worship. These two groups believe that worship has a meaningful purpose in their life an important aspect of life and gives inner peace and make life happy. Students with mediocre academic achievement also consider worship as an important aspect of their life, but low performing students perceive worship program as what? As a burden, 
an activity that annoys them and doesn't enjoy and feel happy with it. And then, students with excellent academic achievement have a better behavior in worship when compared to other respondents, while students with mediocre academic achievement and low performing students show low rating behavior in worship. They attended worship to what? To avoid punishment and didn't want to take part in leading or taking responsibility for the worship program. And also, uh, in the last slide, as the recommendations, the study recommend the institution for its effort to keep spirituality as one of the most important aspects of education and prepare very good worship program for students, which in turn help the students achieve good academic performance. A proportion of small speci special students who are not interested in religious and spiritual activities and also show low academic achievement must be carefully nurtured as their problem, but might be beyond academic and spiritual reason. Uh, and then the researcher suggested that further study may be conducted on the national and international faith-based education institution in another area of Indonesia where national and multinational institutions operate. This, uh, this recommendation will, um, will run by pastors and may, uh, counselors and many and all the leaders in the uh, institution, Adventist institution. Okay. Until this is my present presentation, thank you. Thank you, everybody. If you have a uh, question, please. Rejecting the null hypothesis within its factors, <laughs> so effects. So we're using the defense size. So how how are you going to deal with this? We deal with this. The, yeah, because the goal of the regression is for us to get a model okay. to generalize, and our sample size is too small. So this is too small for us to generalize. The way I understand it, we get the twenty four percent the the average. So we, so we made the normal curve there, you propose to ask them, but I think it's, it's not that inclusive for us to, to have that model since it's okay. so small. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so, Christian. Oh, yeah. Uh, because uh, the The coordinator answered only uh, 10 slides, so I, I only this one, right? Yeah. What I mean is that the observation is too small but for us to do the virtual true spider. Okay. Yeah, and the effect size is not. Yeah. <laughs> My advisor uh, helped me to uh, to make this uh, regression according uh, using the SPSS, SPSS and by Cronbach's uh, alpha to measure this regression. And uh, you know that even the student uh, lazy to uh, following the worship. I can make sure that uh, they will pass the, uh, the subject and will graduation and will follow the graduation. But uh, according to this uh, regression, as we can see, this the standard error is zero point two nine nine two. It means it means uh, this. This regression uh, or this the result can be can be interpreted as uh, okay. 
can be interpreted as uh, the data uh, can be interpreted as model fit and data will not and, and not overfitting. So as you can see, uh, the majority students, 68% of variant GPA can be explained by the model. The model is one. GPA, GPA is equal to 0.080 plus 0.646, attitude and plus, this is the attitude and plus 0.3439 GPA plus zero. Actually, what is what he was uh, what is inquiry was all about is after requisite before you can interpret those things. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, maybe we can <coughs> we can do something about it by doing some bootstrap in this. Just for the statistic because uh, yeah, we accept that parity is not really enough. Especially when you have two variants. Oh, especially when you have three. But it was the problem with the So, but there is a way of simple meetings. Yeah. We can do post-strap yeah. post analysis. How, how to make it, sir? So I can yeah. uh, this case is has the post-strap analysis. No, you can do post-strap. No, the, the work of post is uh, there are respond, ten respondents. And that's going to get some samples, samples, two samples, and it's going to get the new. It will actually multiply the respondents mm -hmm. by itself. So it means that uh, getting someone, uh, some No need, no need. Oh, Just take the respondents, the third respondents, and do the bootstrapping analysis. Bootstrapping analysis. Bootstrapping. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. It's okay. a specific, uh, mm -hmm. another another file in SPSS that you can download. It's an additional SPSS has that. Unless you're going to use also the process by case, mm -hmm. with okay. the mediation and moderation. Thank you, thank you. I will inform to uh, his advisor. Okay, thank you very much for yeah. uh, uh, the presentations and uh, some clarifications and also the Okay. For the next presenter is Dr. Balila. The title of the presentation is Exploratory Factor Analysis of Religious Engagement Among Seven Day Adventists in Southern Asia Pacific Division An Outlook for New Dimensions. Yes. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'll be talking about exploratory factor analysis of religious engagement among Seventh-day Adventists in the Southern Asia Pacific and outlook for new dimensions. Uh, my co-authors here are myself and Dr. Arceli Rosario, our beloved president. Uh, Pastor Fernando was talking about theology and, and psychology. I'll be talking here about statistics and theology. But, uh, I'll, but I would be discussing more of 
What the so theology ba? <laughs> what I do not have enough knowledge in theology. Maybe half half. Okay. <clears throat> so an exploratory factor analysis of religious engagement among 70 Adventists in Southern Asia Pacific, an outlook for new dimension. Now, what is religious engagement? Relig religious engagement is actually, uh, this refers actually to the level of involvement, participation, and commitment of individuals or communities in religious or spiritual activities. Now, religious engagement can be defined in terms of uh, you are engaged, you are religiously engaged when you are participating in worship. You are religiously engaged if you, uh, if you have the belief and faith, religious knowledge and study, prayer and meditation, religious affiliation and interfaith dialogue. If you are involved of those things, we can say, that you are religiously engaged. <clears throat> uh, according to Rebecca, Richard, and Adona are side in religious engagement has four, and he was, uh, they're actually quoting Macafre in 2017. Uh, they talk about four dimensions of religious engagement, namely belief, uh, behavior, belonging, and benefiting. So when we talk about religious engagement, it has to do with belief, behavior, belonging, and benefiting. However, the subject when they do this, when they did this study, the subjects are for adolescents. Now, in my study, in our study, we want to find out what are the dimensions. So, Rebecca and Richard were able to identify four dimensions. But in our case, that is only for adolescents. The, the respondents are adolescents. Now, in, in our study, we want to find out what are the dimensions of religious engagement in the viewpoint of 70 Adventists within the territory of the Southern Asia Pacific Division? Now, here is the method. The study is uh, a cross-sectional data which are taken from 13 countries under the territory of the Southern Asia Pacific Division. And it under, the data underwent analysis using exploratory factor analysis, that's a uh, statistics part. In uh, exploratory factor analysis is a technique actually on how to dimensionalize the variables. And we will see later on that the objective actually is to find dimensions of religious engagement. Just like, just like a while ago that uh, that Rebecca and Richard, quoting McAfee, they were able to find four dimensions. They call it four Bs, no? four dimensions of religious engagement. But these are for the according to the adolescent people. But here, we want to find out what is the uh, what are the dimensions of religious engagement in the viewpoint of 70 Adventists within the territory of SSD. Now, so this is the data. It underwent through, the data underwent through exploratory analysis and then subjected by another software called AMOS in order to develop the, the strength of the questionnaire. Okay, so the item underwent KMO Kaiser, Mayer, Olken, this is actually under factor analysis, no? Kaysen, Older, uh, Kaysen, Mayer, Olken, KMO. Now, uh, originally there were so many items and subjecting to KMO, those items we did not pass through the scrutiny of KMO uh, with less than 0.5, it was deleted. So it turned out that 
because the KMO should be 0.5 and above. And then it turned out, using all of this, it turned out that from among many items, there were only 12 items left. So that's, those are the subjects for factor analysis. Now, here are the indicators. Uh, so because it was subjected by KMO, the result was like this. Now, the, the overall KMO is 0.886, which is significant at, points, at level 0 0.00. Alpha equals 0 0.00 level. So here are the, I don't know if you can read this one. These are the, these are the items or the indicators that uh, we're able to pass through the scrutiny of KMO. My Sabbath school teachers or leaders care about me. Other people in my church care about me. I apply what I learned from Sabbath school lesson in my daily life, and so on and so forth. Now here is, in order for me to extract how many dimensions would there be under religious engagement, uh, I run the what we call script plot analysis. Now the script plot analysis will, will tell you how many dimensions would that be. So uh, you will see here that there will be four dimensions. One slope, another slope, and then another slope, and another slope. It's labeled down. So it seems that there will be four dimensions under religious engagement. Now here when I did the fact, when we did the factor analysis, here is the result. Uh, it's very interesting that among the four, among the, uh, the 12, it clusters into four dimensions. Factor one, and later on we are going to baptize them. What are those, what are, what's the name of those factors? Factor one, uh, those items that clusters under factor one, my pastor cares about me, my Sabbath school teachers or leaders care about me, and so on and so forth. And factor two, then factor three, and factor four. So, so the commonality signify, these are the, which are called commonalities, no? signify the extent to which variables, variance is accounted for by its respective factors. Now, here is the indicators uh, that we can really say that, uh, that the instrument will measure accurately. Now, here, what you can see here, is the 73.279, it means that 73% of the concept can be explained by this instrument. 70% no? of the religious engagement can be explained. For example, if you are going to, to, uh, to use this questionnaire and give, it to the, give them to the people around, then it will measure 73.249%. So that's the implication of this. And that's quite big already. Okay. Now, here is the, here is the latent factor. So under, under factor one, we call it religious community social support. That's factor one. And then under factor two, I apply what I learned from Sabbath school lesson to my daily life, that is application of religious teaching. And then factor three, that's under church ministry training. And then uh, factor four, youth empowerment. So from those people who are, who are under the territory of SSD, this is their opinion, that religious engagement has four dimensions, namely, religious community social support, application of religious teaching, church ministry training, and youth empowerment. To, to analyze further, we import this one to Amos. And so, and you will see here that the, stre this, the, the strength is really big. Because uh, we have here, the, uh, uh, because if you are going to do factor analysis, it should test the dis, uh, discriminant and convergent validity. So for the discriminant, you see that it passes through the scrutiny of the discriminant validity. And also the last four column is the uh, discriminant, 
Yeah, this one is convergent and the other one is discriminant validity. So it's passing through the, cross, the scrutiny of convergent and discriminant validity. So uh, in summary or discussion, so under religious community social support, we have three indicators. And under application of religious teachings, again, we have three. And then uh, we, have a, we have a remark here, constructs capture practical application and relevance of religious teachings in shaping one's life, one's daily life and behavior. And uh, this three is under church ministry training. And the last one is under youth empowerment. So all in all, we have, we were able to, this is actually our ultimate goal for us to be able to uh, dimensionalize the religious engagement and we have these four dimensions. And thank you very much. Thank you very much. Okay, please. Uh, ah, that's a very good question. Or, and number two, what do you read? Are you going to name this? Or, because I think you need to go into the next one, which is the construct validity. Okay, that's, that's a very good question. Uh, the, in, in factor analysis, there are two, there are two yes. parts. Not parts, there are two kinds of factor analysis. The first one is exploratory factor analysis. And the second one is confirmatory factor analysis. The reason why it is called confirmatory because whatever is the theory, it will it will it will confirm whether the theory is yeah it will either confirm the theory or define the theory. So that's under confirmatory analysis. Mine is exploratory analysis. We explore, so we do not rely on some theories here uh, because. Uh, maybe further study is going to use this so that we'll be able to uh, to strengthen this theory. So this is an exploratory factor analysis. So we don't need uh, to satisfy theories around. <laughs> Unlike confirmatory factor analysis. Um, so what's the name of the theory that ever you're going to name? My name is theory. <laughs> <laughs> So there's yeah. a theory that I think the construct yeah. will be established. Yeah, yeah. Theoretically, that will be established. It is passed through the scrutiny of factor analysis. So if you want to uh, further the study, uh, you are welcome. Yeah. Okay, one more question. Yes, sir. Could you go back to the last slide? The conclusion on that. Uh, this one. Uh, the, the respondents were adolescents. No. no. Uh, the church members. Church members of S of NSD. Oh, NSD. Yeah, all of us actually. All of the yeah. uh, SSD. Different uh, yeah. level from children different to level. adult. Uh, yeah. From youthhood to adulthood. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, okay. Thank you very much. So this is their this is what uh -huh. they say. Okay, thank you very much. I would like to present the certificate of presentations that is given to Dr. Edwin Balila for delivering an oral presentation entitled An Exploratory Effector Analysis of Religious Engagement Among Seven Day Adventists in Southern Asia Pacific An Outlook for New Dimensions. And this certificate is signed by the uh, presidents of the four collaborative universities. Okay, for the last presentations, it will be Winilfred Pasamba with the 
title Benefits of Asynchronous Students Chapel Convocation. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Pastor. Okay. Good noon, everyone. Let me present these uh, benefits of asynchronous uh, student convocations. So, this happened in the pandemic. We had a big opportunity to, even if there is lockdown, so we just want to learn uh, some things about this. It is, I say it's a big opportunity because it's the biggest class in the university. It has about 2,400 to 2,700 students. So you can imagine if you have a problem with your forums, which has several hundreds, you can imagine this like times 10, the size to manage this biggest class. And the university, it's like, it's like work education. It's like forum. It's like an STP, which has hundreds of people, and thousands actually, 3,000 almost. We tried to inject ideas using questions. You know, there's an idea where you can, that's how Satan injected also, by asking questions. So because we, people watch the videos, but how to engage them? Because nobody you know, pays attention. So in face-to-face in -face chapel periods, the 40% the uh, had poor grades. So I, I look at the numbers. And in, but in asynchronous, during the pandemic, the grades of 80% were about, about 80% was excellent, yeah? So it seems to promise a lot just to increase the grades. The number one, and this is uh, according to Matthew 13, because uh, the number one cause of backsliding is not understanding the doctrines. Jesus, parable of the sower. So it's not... Uh, this is according to Jesus, yeah? not according to a survey of backsliders. So uh, even that one time we tried, I tried to put as many questions as I could because the grades don't go down. More questions, more information they get, but the grades are still 80% about the same. So I just, so that the most number of questions in one semester we were able to inject into the quizzes was 727 doctrinal questions, yeah? And we tried to make everything like black and white, heaven and hell, God versus Satan, those uh, things. To, so it's still 71% excellent because it's open notes. It's open everything, open chat, GPT open. So we realized that people are sharing their answers in the group chats. So we converted the answers to Bible verses so they will be sharing Bible verses to their classmates. <laughs> So uh, we tried, uh, with, what is this, short and simple. It's a short, simple experiment or research, but the, but the effect can be very big. That's why it's not so complicated, but the effect is far reaching and very big. These computers, they help us reach more people, yeah? So what we can learn, so we experimented, we used Moodle, that's the online platform that I study. Uh, we just made the class and then we recorded and we live stream in PIC. Even if it's a pandemic, we could, uh, we were allowed, the audiovisual people were allowed to be there. And uh, we put the options, you know, in a multiple choice. You cannot manage 2,700 students with essay. You, can, you will have to read the whole, two weeks to read all the answers. So we put only a multiple choice. But, to be able to inject ideas from the Bible, because Ellen White says, one sentence of scripture is worth more than 10,000 of human ideas. To increase the value of the quiz is to put more Bible verses, so times 10,000, times 10,000 every Bible verse, okay? So uh, we realized that only 400 people, students, watch the videos until the end. The thousands of views we get from PIC and AUP page our fans, they are visitors and friends. Because we have, we have 6,000, 10,000 views. We only have 3,000 students. So only about, so comprehensive, we tried to put all the things in the fundamental beliefs <laughs> inside the sermon. If the preacher forgets, preaches about stewardships and forgets to put tithe, I put there questions about tithe. So we had tried, tried to put everything there to reverse the effect that the backsliding is because of the not understanding uh, doctrines. Okay, 
the basis, why do we do this experiment? Okay, the work of education and redemption are one. What else? The MOAP says student convocation is for all students. So no more need to excuse because it's asynchronous. You don't have to excuse the people who are in OJT and so on because they can watch it later, right? I graduated from UP Open University. There is no excuse even if you have work, you can finish because it's asynchronous. So can be used in place where, uh, where there's, uh, if there are people who stay outside, they don't have regular worship. So like if they have OJT or something, you can replace that. And they are not in uh, regulated residences like we are in campus. These are another basis. We should teach them diligently, our children, our students. Examine yourself, meaning quizzes, yeah? Quizzes, doctrinal quizzes. Let us examine and test our ways if we still understand the Lord. And of course, we have to fix the truth in their mind while we read along the road while we drive when you get up, etc. And to make our students more intelligent, I have more understanding than all my teachers for their testimonies or my meditation. It's very important to have basis. It should be the work of every teacher to make prominent these truths that have called us out as a peculiar. So if some teachers cannot really uh, help to do that, at least this one will uh, compensate. Yeah? None but those who have fortified the mind with the truths of the Bible stand through the great last conflict. So, of course, it is a continuous sanctification. Results, four times more excellent grades than face-to-face. -face. I'm not saying face-to-face -face is bad because the Bible also says you come together more as the day approaches. So, but if we combine, maybe we can get more, yeah, more people in the net. So, sorry for Somebody's asking, okay, okay. So excuses can be eliminated. The question, my friends, is this baptism. This is, uh, I tried to ask who wants to be, get baptized. Everybody answered yes, but nobody came to church <laughs> to actually come. So I was thinking maybe they think it's a quiz answer and they have to answer correctly. <laughs> At least they understand what is correct, but to, to come, I don't know how to convert it. So that, Oh, maybe, maybe. Asynchronous baptism. Okay. That one I, I, I have never thought of measuring because we can only, I can only count what is coming out in the computer. So these are the, what happened when we converted. It used to be 36% poor, 20% excellent. When the Ta'al erupted, we had exempt everyone. And then the next semester, we tried. We put 146 questions. This is the number of people. This is the number of students. These are the number of attendees. Some people attend and take the quiz even if they're not students. They like it, yeah? Some people really like chapel, even if they're not students. So uh, the last one is this one, 700. Still almost the same, yeah? Almost the same, about 80, 70%. When it's face-to-face, -face, again, excellent, went down to 23% again. So maybe the asynchronous can help. So recommendation, asynchronous possibilities to all, all religions, not only chapel. Uh, we wish to put everything that is Adventist belief and sermon in the internet because it also helped me strengthen my faith. And Ellen White says, what helped you come near to Jesus, you also want, you, it to, you want to use it to bring others to Jesus. That's the reason why I'm interested in this. Train people to multiply because I want to do it, but you know, we have the camera is will not get tired, but you will get tired. So we, the more people you can train, the more people you can, uh, can do the same thing that you're doing. And for teaching more pedagogical experiments to verify the observations that uh, we were able to. Uh, that's all. Thank you. So. Thank you. If you have questions, please. No questions?
Uh, no, Pastor. How, uh, in in face to face, they only check attendance. So if you look at the people, they are playing in their cell phones. So even if attendance, I think it cannot you cannot measure really the. But there are many baptisms in face to face. So uh, that one we have to. I don't know if what to do with that one. Yes, sir. Uh, yeah. Sorry, it's me again. But then, uh, I have a question. Maybe uh, or give me a suggestion. Maybe you can take a look also on the different demographic variables and what does um, it says about the responses. Would that be different from male or female, from first year to fourth year, from SD or non SD or so on? Maybe you can check on that so that the, the um, <laughs> you know, the, the results will be more inclusive and it can provide more information for a policy recommendation. Yeah, we have to look also uh, for the basis of uh, differentiating those things. Yeah, of course, in the Bible it counts men, but it, for, it doesn't count women and so on. So, we want. I want my study to the methodology. Ha we should be. Ha that's why I did this one because there is methodology. So, this is a, this is not only academic; it's also spiritual, and it has to be. I want to find to find the methodology from the Bible. So. Thank you very much for the presentation and I would like to present this speaker for Brother Winifred Pasamba for delivering an oral presentation entitled Benefits of Asynchronous Students Chapel Convocations and this ticket signed by the Presidents of the Collaborative uh, Universities. Which approach do you think so that our student will be more religious? Asynchronous or synchronous? Excellent question. Jesus came to be synchronous. <laughs> but he also told the writers, Habakkuk 2.22, write the vision. It is asynchronous. Right? So... Bible, you can see both in the Bible. Not my idea. We just read Bible. Amen. Everything is there. <laughs> Thank you very much for the presentations and for the attendance for uh, this first uh, parallel sessions. And we'll close our sessions. Pastor Waloy, would you like to offer a word of prayer for close the sessions? Let's pray. Thank you, loving Father, for the success of our presentations this morning. Thank you, Lord, for the wisdom that we gain from these academic exercises. Help us, help us that we can continue to use those knowledge so that we can uh, apply it also and we can also be a blessing to the institutions that we are serving. Thank you for being with us, and may you dismiss us with your blessings in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. See you for the next session.